Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, machaba, mori mori wanji, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app. On Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Maryland. Our guest is here today to celebrate her debut graphic novel. It's called Skeletor the Decomposer. Please welcome to the show, Emily Etlinger. Hey, Emily, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful. I can't wait. I I. I said to um, Emily and her publicist uh, that they, they grabbed my interest at The Decomposer. I, <laughs> there's just something about that I love. Tell us all about Skelenor and why she's such a great decomposer. <laughs> uh, so Skelenor is a skeleton who loves music, loves playing instruments, um, and she's having trouble because she really wants to play in the town band at the upcoming festival. Um, but every time she tries to show her music, all the townspeople run away from her. So she's got to figure out what's going on. That is so, that's such <laughs> a great, fun idea. This, you know, this cute little skeleton who loves music and loves making people happy, but just terrifies people. <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't know what's what's happening. So, yeah. um, and she keeps trying different instruments, and none of them are working. And and I love that she thinks it's the instrument instruments that are scaring the people away, and that it's not her. Well, we don't know what is it. <laughs> so I don't want to spoil anything. Where was where did the idea for this come from? Um. So the base idea came from. I was just doodling a, um, I drew a skeleton playing a fiddle, and I really like the idea that we kind of collectively all agree skeletons like music. There's all these illustrations of them playing in bands and dancing around and having little skeleton music parties. Um, so I just, I mean, that basic pitch I gave you was the base idea of like, oh, what if she, what if this skeleton really wanted to be in a band? And like didn't really get what was like wrong with her like running around like she's very active she's very like one of the jocular like popping up out of places like you know grinning skull like excitable skeletons yeah so you were telling me before the podcast began that you uh, are primarily a comic writer um <laughs> But that Skelenor started life, uh, the, the idea for Skelenor started life as a idea for a picture book, and then kind of morphed into a, a graphic novel for, for kids. How did that happen, and why did the f- powers that be, including yourself, decide that, oh, this is a story best told through the graphic novel format? Well, originally, um, so this started during the pandemic, and... I really wanted to make something that I felt was manageable. So a shorter story, like a picture book, even though my interest had always been longer comics, um, seemed a little bit easier to get done and pitch. And then as I was trying to write it, I kept on wanting, because I'm used to comics, I kept on wanting more on the page and kept on wanting characters to like speak in speech bubbles um, and imagining that in my head. So then it turned into a picture book length comic that we pitched. Um, And then the publisher, uh, the first publisher who bit was Penguin um, Workshop. And they came back and said, hey, we're interested in this, but would you be interested in like making it? Do you think you could make it twice as long um, and make it a full graphic novel? 
And at first I was like, mm, I don't know. And then I accidentally like quadrupled the length. Like I made it like four <laughs> times as long because jokes actually, there was one joke I had to cut up, cut out because it took like four pages to tell like the whole setup. And it just like, I still like it, but it's like, it, I couldn't, I just like, it actually takes up so much space sometimes to tell a joke. So a lot had to get cut out, unfortunately. You know, you really, you make it a good point. Something that I think, um, we don't think about that much. When I was growing up and I thought comic, I always thought comedy. Mm-hmm. To me, comic strips and you know, in, in the newspapers, I know there were some adventure ones like Prince Valiant and whatnot, but to me it was just like that. Oh, I read the comics to get a laugh. And mm-hmm. it was the same when it came to uh, comic books. I, I never kind of thought of comics but even though I was looking at comics for comedy I, I, I never thought of comic strip writers as comedians or comedy writers <laughs> and you are you're you at your core you're a comedy writer I mean I do like writing jokes I love I mean the title has two puns in it so you know I love um, a lot of puns yeah. So I, I, I guess the, I typically will ask an author, illustrator, you know, what comes first, the illustrations or the words. For you, what comes first, the illustrations or the jokes? Well, it's it was um, it's like like I said, this is my first book, so it was a little interesting having to work in like a publisher's timeline rather than my own, because normally I'd be writing. I'd be drawing the thumbnails at the same time as I'm writing to see like, oh, okay, can I fit this in? Can like, do I have to break up this page? Um, as opposed to the publisher wanted a finished script before I moved on, um, to actually drawing. So I was still doing the thumbnails on my own. Um, just to like, cause I was like, I have, I'm, I have a terrible sense of how much script is going to turn into comic. Like I have to be, drawing it at the same time because I'm like this speech bubble actually takes up way more space which means that this page has less space which you know adjusts it changes the whole book and you know fitting in stuff like two page spreads it's a lot of kind of fiddly moving bits around including the text um so it was kind of a challenge to um do the script the like finished script first um, but, uh, it, it worked out. So, and it was nice to, you know, not have to have drawn the whole thing for somebody to say, this part's not working. Can you change it? Cause that would have been, uh, a lot more work than just deleting a line of text in a word document. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've had some interesting conversations with graphic novel artists and, and authors, um, one of them came on the show, and uh, I, I asked her the inf- inspiration for her character uh, and the look of her character, and she said, uh, very honestly, she goes, I knew I was going to have to draw this 800 <laughs> times, so I made it as simple as possible. <laughs> and and then the very next day, I was speaking to somebody who was doing a graphic novel about ancient Greek history, and she said, this is such a challenge because I have to do everything <laughs> and there's details and this. So it was completely different uh, point of view or, or, or process mm-hmm. for them. No, I couldn't do a historical comic for exactly <laughs> that reason. I'd be so freaked out about getting everything accurate and, you know, doing all the research on on the littlest things. Yeah. What is it, do you think, about skeletons that <laughs> really delight kids? I mean, because you, we do, we joke about them, we have all these these dopey kid jokes, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, why didn't the skeleton, skeleton go to the prom? He had no Bobby to, to dance with. Uh, <laughs> the kids love them. Um, why, why do you think that is? I think it's a little, I think it's a, I guess, brand of scary that's a little bit more um, accessible and friendly. Like, um I think that we have these like very specific, um, you know, spooky characters, like 
But you see, you know, on Halloween, like, packaging and stuff, like a wolf man and, you know, Frankenstein's monster and a mummy and a skeleton. So I think we're actually exposed to it, like, pretty early on. Like, I grew up with Scooby-Doo, which is, like, very <laughs> classic brand of, like, yeah, it's it's spooky. It's not, like, horror. Mm-hmm. It's It's just, like, a little bit of fun, but it's not that threatening. There's not any, like gore this is just a you know friendly monster yeah well not friendly in scooby-doo's case but <laughs> well and, yeah, and and that's a good point um because spooky is different than horror um yeah stephen king doesn't write spooky <laughs> he yeah. writes terrifying and nightmares <laughs> and childhood trauma um mm-hmm. so yeah okay so i get that what is it that are, are you drawn to draw spooky comics and <laughs> stories i didn't i didn't particularly think of myself as one but i kind of noticed like oh like half my stories have a ghost in them um like uh you know i was setting up my t- like pinned twitter so i was picking like pictures that i liked to kind of be like i'm an artist here's some of my art and two of them like Two of them had skeletons and one had witches. So I'm like, oh, I guess, I guess I draw this stuff a lot. It just hadn't really occurred to me as something that was like, that I drew that often compared to anybody else, Mm -hmm. which I think it's actually, um, that kind of, uh, character is popular right now in particular. Again, maybe because my generation grew up with Scooby Doo and stuff with Casper the Friendly Ghost. Um, it's like very, um, I think little creatures and monsters and stuff like that are, are very popular right now. Yeah. I was having this a discussion, I think it was with my beautiful wife, about the cartoons that her and I grew up with. And I'm much older than her, and I'm, I'm decades older than you. And <laughs> we're talking about, you know, Bugs Bunny and the, you know, the Roadrunner and, and the Wile E. Coyote. And a lot of those com- those cartoons that we're watching probably couldn't be made today. I, I, I don't know if it's, if it would be cool to have a whole, um, cartoon, you know, 30 minute cartoon about a, uh, one creature trying to blow up, a, a you know, a, a road runner, um, and, you know, coming up with all sorts of ways to destroy the, the road runner. Um, have you noticed that there's been a change in, in cartoons and comics from when you were growing up to what's, uh, appropriate and acceptable now? Um, I mean, I think there has, there's always going to be a change. Um, cause it's been, you know, 20 years since I was a kid. Um, but I think that I'm seeing a lot more, not necessarily for little kids, um, like super, super little, but for, I don't know, seven and up, I've seen a lot of cartoons that really, um, focus on empathy, which I really like. Um, seeing personally. Um, One thing that I saw a lot as a kid that irritated me when I was a kid was seeing these like specific episodes. Um, The ones I remember the most are like girl power episodes Mm -hmm. being like, hey, girls are people too. And even as a kid, I was like, why do we have to have a specific episode that they say this? Shouldn't this be prevalent in your show like inherently? Um, And some of them would have, like, the male characters that I'm supposed to like being jerks. And I'm like, why are you friends with this guy if this is what he thinks? So I feel like I've seen more um, shows where that's just that kind of lesson is more built into the show and doesn't feel as awkward. Mm -hmm. Um, Being like, everyone's a person and, you know, different people have different problems. Um, So, I mean, I... I'm happy for the change and they still show like Bugs Bunny and you know I'm a I'm a big fan of slapstick comedy unfortunately if someone gets hurt but not you know not seriously hurt I unfortunately giggle a little which is um not kind but you know I still think that there's plenty of that um maybe a little less violent but still kind of harmless yeah um you know somebody good exploding you know i i certainly am a, f- a fan of slapstick comedy but but i'll be honest with you i've 
Well, I can watch Bugs Bunny and all those classic things all day long. Three Stooges, huge fan. But um, there are a couple of feeds that come up on my Instagram of, you know, just people doing dumb things or accidents happening. And I have a real hard time watching <laughs> Watching oh, if if, if it pe- looks like someone got hurt, I'm like, <laughs> I, I get upset that it was posted at all. But if it's clear that everyone's fine, it's just mm-hmm. like somebody did something foolish, mm-hmm. then then I'll laugh. But again, if it's like, oh, if you have to like clench your mm-hmm. jaw when you see it, then mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not laughing. The graphic novel is. I'm really I'm, I'm I'm seeing this trend that we're we're having more and more graphic novels, more and more for younger and younger kids. Mm-hmm. Um, is that what you're seeing? And and how how do you feel about that? Do you think that this again? You were thinking initially that Scalinor would be a picture book. Um, are, are you loving the fact that there are more opportunities for comic writers like you to do graphic novels for younger audiences? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so I got into comics originally through um, manga, um, Japanese comics, and I was I was making comics with my friends since I was in fifth grade. Um, but it wasn't like I didn't really see anything I was interested in as much in American comics. I was never into DC or Marvel. Um, and I mean, except for maybe like, you know, Calvin and Hobbes. Um there wasn't that much that I was uh, like attached to for American comics. And I'd kind of like, um, I wouldn't say I'd given up on it being like a career thing, like kind of near the end of college. Cause I was like, uh, this isn't like, there's not really a market for this. And that's kind of when it exploded. <laughs> and there was like so much, like there's been, always been American indie comics, but a lot of them are, were styles that like either I didn't have exposure to them because they're more adult or they weren't styles that I liked. Um, and it feels like my, again, my generation who grew up on manga, like was like, we want this, like we want these stories and this style, we're like in these styles that are like way that are, have just like a much bigger range than just like specifically superheroes. Um, so it's very cool to see like all the stuff that's come out, um, in the last like five, 10 years. That's just completely different than, you know, when I was coming up. Yeah. So uh, talk, not that I'm enough of, uh, uh, of an artist or know enough about art to understand, but can you talk a little bit about that style that you're referring to, especially your style and, uh, you know, how would you describe it? So I liked, uh, let's see, it's very hard to describe style, I think, but um, I just like the styles that I saw in manga, more like anime-y, like uh, leaning more towards trying to make things like, um, like I read a lot of shoujo, which is like girls manga, so a lot of kind of prettier illustrations, more flowery, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but also um, uh, more like gritty comics that really focus on like having, um, I don't know, I guess like style's hard, but it's also, I'd say the stories, um, I liked the flow of manga better. They're generally longer series mm-hmm. um, that I felt like I could get into the characters more. Um, and they were all like, I mean, they had assistants, but it was one main artist working on it as opposed to like um, American comics where you would read part, it would be drawn by like one person, then it would switch over to another person and it felt less cohesive. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, like the art for them is still amazing. It was just not something that drew me in Mm -hmm. um, as a kid. Um, The stories either, especially, you know, there was a lot of uh, detective stuff, um, 
or of like kind of teen drama, like, you know, Archie, Mm -hmm. um, which teen drama is very prevalent in like manga. I'm not saying that, but you know, it was just felt new. Well, I love the the illustration of uh, Skelenor on your website is delightful. I'm you. I mean, it really is. It's fun. You have this um, uh, skeleton um, <laughs> playing a violin, and there's a starry night sky behind it, and all the you know kind of musical notes dancing around her. It's uh, definitely something that I I can see kids and families just really loving a whole lot. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I And also, as I'm looking at that, I'm, I'm thinking, this would almost, it, not almost, I said, thought that this would be a fun comic strip to read in the newspaper every day. Although, if your jokes are taking four pages to tell, <laughs> you true. probably couldn't tell them in three panels. I could, I yeah, I could shorten some. I mean... I think skeletons have a lot of, um, you know, we're talking about slapstick skeletons. Mm-hmm. It feels very easy to have, you know, an arm pop off without any, without anyone being like concerned. Cause mm-hmm. again, speaking of skeleton lore that we all just accept, which is that, yeah, you could just pop it back on and it's fine. Like, yes. Replace one with another, no problem. Yeah, a yeah. skeleton's head can fall off, and you could put a pump in there instead, and she's fine. Well, you know the thing about a uh, a daily comic strip uh, is that it's out every day, and there's new stories. Uh, are we going to see? Is Skelenor going to become a series? Do you think? Uh, it uh, it I guess it could be. Um, you don't want to jinx it. I can tell in your voice. Yeah. yeah. I could, again, I accidentally doubled or quadrupled the book, so maybe I could write more. Um, but I don't know, a whole series. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll keep our fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> hey, Emily, where can we go to find out more about Skelenor and also find out more about you? Uh, so Penguin Random House's website has it listed. Um, you can find all the information on anywhere books are sold. Um, I found that Skelenor gets autocorrected to Skeletor sometimes. <laughs> um, so you can look up my name if you're having trouble, um, which luckily Etlinger is not that common of a last name. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is E-M-I-E-T-T, um, Emiet, the first three letters of my first and last name, um, dot com. Um, Cool. And, yeah. yeah. Well, we've had a really great time speaking to the author and illustrator of Skelenor the Decomposer. Great graphic novel from Ki- for kids by our guest, Emily Etlinger. Hey, Emily, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast and will join us for the next exciting episode. If you want to make sure you don't miss a second of the show, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitch Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. And also be sure to visit readingwithyourkids.com and download your copy of the Reading With Your Kids online magazine. It's free. It's available at readingwithyourkids.com. Just click on our blog. Before you go, I want to make sure that I give a big thank you to my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Madison Darius, Soji Franklin, Monica Rivera Sosa, and O'Leary. I want to give a big thank you to my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me, and most of all, We all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.